Welcome to this special edition of County Report this week. I'm on Quinette Crosby. Throughout the year, we have brought you countless stories to keep you informed about what's happening in Montgomery County. Today, we take you on a journey back through some of those stories that defined 2017. We begin with a huge victory for transit. Construction of the Purple Line officially got underway. This light rail project will connect Bethesda to New Carrollton. Susan Kennedy was there when the shovels went into the ground and explains what this means for the county. Susan? That's right, it is a big day across the state of Maryland as ground is officially broken for the long-awaited Purple Line. The groundbreaking was the result of the federal government contributing $900 million towards the cost of the project. Montgomery County contributed $120 million of its own. I want to thank Montgomery County and Prince George's County and uh, County Executive Leggett and Baker and their councils for stepping up uh, and agreeing to invest $330 million towards this vital project. It's just great to say, thank goodness we're here and we're going to do it and it's going to be, it's going to change lives. Finally, we're going to be able to entice people out of their cars to commute by fast, safe, speedy, efficient, clean, quiet rail. And, you know, it's going to provide a great connection to the Landover uh, Metro station and um, a train station and, and really create a mobility option that has never existed before. If you live in Glenmont or Wheaton, you'll be able to take the red line to Silver Spring and then take the purple line to the University of Maryland. That was never possible before. You work on these things for years and years and years and then Sometimes it happens. <laughs> when it's all said and done, the Purple Line is estimated to create more than 52,000 new jobs in the state of Maryland. It's going to put so many jobs within close reach of affordable housing. I think it's going to be a game changer for our part of the region. Officials say it couldn't have happened if everybody had not participated. Let me acknowledge and thank our governor because the governor made a commitment to me that they were going to support this project. And despite many challenges, he never wavers. Well, it's been a real team effort. Uh, we really have been one team, Maryland. And uh, we worked with our federal partners and our delegation. We worked with the legislature, the local uh, county governments, and uh, the federal government was the last final part. And after the shovels went in the ground, Governor Hogan himself stepped in an excavator and took part in the first official step in breaking ground on the Purple Line. You know what, that's my first time doing it, but uh, I was telling the guys that I might want to come out and help them a little more. It's a stress reliever. That was a lot, a lot better than the day job I normally do. Reporting from Lanham, I'm Susan Kennedy for County Report This Week. The project is slated to be finished in 2022. Wheaton is getting a major redesign. Executive Ike Leggett broke ground for a project that will pump new life into downtown Wheaton. Lorna Virgili has more about how it will impact the local economy. Lorna? Anquanet, this parking lot will transform into a 14-story building with underground garage that will be housing about six government agencies. One, two, This is an exciting day because many people did not believe that we would make this type of commitment. Uh, as you can see from the community's reaction, they had some skepticism about whether or not the county would make this type of investment and come through, and we have. And uh, we're going to have an exciting project. We started. Uh, we're bringing in a large number of county agencies that will be here to help in terms of the employment base that I think will give Reading a, a real, real shot in the arm. The county is making tremendous infrastructure investment in Wheaton. There's been a lot of work, uh, but really the community has been extraordinary in waiting for so long. Um, but I think the time is right, you know, and sometimes things just come together. Uh, I think this is an amazing project. I think it's going to provide an answer to so many different needs. And, uh, and I can't wait. I can't wait to see it done. I can't wait for the ribbon cutting. Construction is estimated to last three years, and the business community around the Wheaton Triangle has been very vocal about staying in business. 
It's impossible to have a construction project of this magnitude without having some impacts. So I have said to our county officials, you will take care of these people to the best of your ability, right? So parking is an issue. So we're finding alternative parking spots. We're gonna do everything we can to minimize the impacts and lay the groundwork for a more prosperous Wheaton for years to come. The building will house the Maryland National Capital Parks and Planning Commission, the Department of Permitting Services, the Department of Environmental Protection, the Mid-County Regional Services Center, and the Department of Recreation, among other agencies, bringing hundreds of government employees to downtown Wheaton by 2020. For County Report this week, I'm Lorna Virgili. The abduction of Sheila and Catherine Lyons in 1975 shocked the community. And four decades later, the man responsible pled guilty for their murders. Lloyd Welch will spend 48 years behind bars. Montgomery County Assistant Police Chief Russ Hamill describes how detectives linked Welch to the murders. This is probably one of the oldest cold cases of this nature that have been solved in this country. The detectives worked at it doggedly. They traveled all over the country. They conducted many, many hours of interviewing. Um, and again, it was old fashioned police work, doing the interviews, looking at the paperwork, following the paper trails, making the connections that led us to the people that led us to it, ultimately to Lloyd Welsh um, uh, pleading guilty in this case. At the end of the day, um, from the beginning, I, I met with many, many of the officers involved in this case and from the beginning explained this wasn't going to have a happy ending. This is not a happy ending by any measure, by any definition. This is not a happy ending, but it brings an amount of closure to the family and to the community. I hope, I pray, it can bring some solace, some, some meaningful closure to Mr. and Mrs. Lyon and their family. Coming up on County Report this week, after a lot of heated debate, the minimum wage is going up in the county. And a county program that helps those with mental health issues make better choices. Keep it right here. We'll be right back. In Montgomery County, we have a goal to reduce waste and recycle 70% of all waste by 2020. By recycling and reducing waste, we save natural resources and make our community even better. So recycle at home, work, school, everywhere, and keep recycling going. For more information, call the Montgomery County, Maryland Division of Solid Waste Services at 311 or visit montgomerycountymd.gov slash recycling. Keep it going. Recycle more now. Thank you for staying with us during this special edition of County Report this week. I'm Anquanette Crosby. It's now official. The minimum wage in Montgomery County will go up to $15 an hour by 2021. This is an important day for Montgomery County. I'm honored as county executive to have the opportunity to find historic piece of legislation. Again, I want to thank Councilmember Mark Eldridge, to all of the members of the County Council behind it, but more importantly, the coalition that has put forth this great, great piece of legislation through all of their work and all of the efforts they've had over the last year. First one goes tomorrow. <laughs> It's official. The minimum wage has been increased to $15 an hour in Montgomery County. Executive Ike Leggett signed the past legislation at CASA, one of the organizations that advocated for the increase. Reminding people that none of us make $15 an hour. Your struggles and your labors aren't our struggles and our labors. And this is all about you. And, you know, my focus is in getting this done as it comes from out of being a school teacher and being you know, all too painfully aware of what happens when kids come to school hungry, when kids come to school not knowing whether their family's going to be able to have a roof over their head. Those are struggles that we, where I sit, don't deal with, but those are struggles that you deal with, and those are struggles that people ought not to have. And so I'm really happy that we got the 15. The new law faces in the wage increase depending on business size. Companies with more than 50 employees will have to start paying the minimum wage by July 1, 2021. Those with more than 10 employees and less than 50 by 2023. 
and smaller businesses with less than 10 employees not until 2024. This was done to decrease the financial impact on smaller businesses. And I believe because of all of all of the council members, because of the coalition, because of everybody working together, we didn't come up with just legislation. We came up with the best legislation in America. There are hundreds of people with mental illness who are arrested for minor offenses each year. Often, they are released without guidance or direction. But a new program in Montgomery County is working to solve this crisis. Susan Kennedy has the story. On any given day, about 20 to 30 percent of the inmates at the Clarksburg Correctional Facility suffer from some sort of mental illness. In hopes of reducing those numbers, county officials developed a mental health court to divert low-level offenders suffering from mental illness from jail. The bottom line is this is just smart, good government. This is smart public policy. The mental health court here in Montgomery County is coming up on its one-year anniversary. The county council approved funding for the program in its budget. County council member Sidney Katz served on the original task force that implemented the mental health court. This is a way to change someone's life for the positive. We talk about what it costs. Well, it costs not only the cost to incarcerate somebody, it costs their families because they are being incarcerated. It costs the, the fact that they're not being able to work and if they are able to work and all of those things associated. Participants in the mental health court take part in the program voluntarily and the treatment plan is individually developed. Defendants report to a judge each week rather than a probation officer. Officials say the recidivism rate since the program has been introduced has gone down. It is perfectly all right to admit that you have an illness in your brain, just like you would admit that you have an illness in your gut or in your shoulder or in your leg, then more people will get treatment earlier before uh, they end up interacting with the criminal justice system. Demand for this service is growing. There is currently a waiting list to participate in the mental health court. How the county moves ahead with this initiative is something council members say they will consider carefully. At the end of the day, this is a money saver. The people I can treat in mental health who can present once and then don't come back, take an enormous load off the rest of the system. We need to figure out how to not only take the load off the system, but to help these people. These are people who are presented with issues that the choices they make aren't really clear choices like most of the rest of us make. I think this is really a great day for Montgomery County, and thank you to all the members of the council for their support on this issue. Good. Reporting you, from much. Rockville, I'm Susan Kennedy for County Report This Week. Food insecurities are a problem for many people in our region, but one local college has teamed up with a local partner to help lift that burden. Montgomery College's Student Health and Wellness Center for Success recently partnered with the Capital Area Food Bank to provide the Mobile Market, a food supply that is at no cost and open to the public. Multiple times throughout the year, MC will host mobile markets on each of its campuses. We probably served more than maybe 300 people this time, but next time it's going to be even bigger. This is just one tenant of our Student Health and Wellness Center, and we know in order to be well, we need to be able to eat, and so this is what we did today. Finding a healthy source of food is unfortunately a challenge for many in the county, and MC student population is not exempt from this. It's difficult to pay those tuitions and those book bills and everything, and then to have to go to the grocery store, and that can be one of the last things you're actually paying. Anybody that walks up will be served. We don't need your ID. We don't need a ton of information from you. All we need is how many people are in your household, basically. The ideal is for everyone to go home with at least 40 pounds of fresh produce. The food is gathered through donations from grocery stores and the general public. Currently we brought out 3,000 pounds. Next month it'll be closer to the 6,000 pound range. We will always have fresh produce here. Uh, the rest of it is going to be things like dairy or bread, um, things that we need to get out of our food bank immediately and doesn't go to waste. The value to MC student population is tremendous. Think about being a student or think about being an individual who isn't sure where your next meal is coming from and the impact of that. It's great for our education because if you're low in produce, it's like you can't function. It's remarkable, honestly, feeding everybody. There's such an epidemic with people who don't eat day to day and healthy food is the way to definitely help students. 
We have students who are homeless, we have employees who are hungry, we have opportunities that we can partner with community groups to help. So this is raising awareness while at the same time providing a much needed resource. To find locations and times for upcoming mobile markets and other food resources at MC, go to montgomerycollege.edu and search Fuel for Success. For County Report This Week, I'm Neil Hodgkinson. When we come back, we visit a Rockville school that has quite a legacy, and it's one for the history books. Plus, local athletic directors talk race and equality in high school sports. Those stories and more when we come back. Did you know there are more than 10,000 county government phone numbers? But there's only one number you need to remember for non-emergency calls, 311. MC311 is Montgomery County government's online telephone information system. Need information? Have a problem or complaint? Trying to locate a county government facility? Call 311. The call center is open Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. The website is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Welcome back to the best of County Report this week. Our show today highlights some of the stories that moved us in 2017. February is Black History Month, and in Rockville, there's a school with a legacy of education even during segregation. Rock 11's Kathy Densler has more. As Rockville 11 celebrates Black History Month, we want to shine a light on a part of Rockville's history that still lives on today turning back the hands of time to a place in America's history that most aren't proud of, the era of segregation. Back then, black students who lived in Montgomery County had to travel outside the county to continue their education past elementary school. So in 1951, when George Washington Carver High School and Junior College opened its doors, it was the beginning of the change that was needed to push for equality in education. Carver was the first all African American high school and junior college in Montgomery County. For the first time, a long time, we as a black community, we had something brand new and that was exciting. We got new books. And it was the first time the boxes and things were opened by the students and put here and there and so forth. What a great opportunity I had to be educated in such a wonderful, wonderful school and such wonderful, wonderful teachers. They were so proud that they fought so hard to get a new high school. Mm -hmm. And that was important for them. And while the fight against segregation was going on outside, the students inside Carver were somehow sheltered from the struggle once they entered the building. The social life was wonderful. Mm -hmm. The kids that did go to the integrated schools really missed it when we talk about Carver. Right. They say we really missed that. If these walls could talk, they would tell you the stories of learning, love, laughter, and a tale of a bond that only those who walk the halls of Carver could understand. For County Report This Week, I'm Kathy Dantzler. Normally, they would be on opposing sides, but not for this. Athletic directors from NCPS tackled race and equality on and off the field. MCPS TV has the story. In September, high school athletic directors and the Central Athletics Office came together for two days of equity training to identify strategies for promoting cultural responsiveness throughout all of MCPS athletics programs. This is the first time that all the athletic directors from every high school are getting together to really begin conversations around race and equity and how those issues impact engagement in athletics in Montgomery County schools. We are doing positive things to promote equity and access, and we're willing to have conversations that are tough and talk about race. 
The equity team and study circles teams have really helped us in teaching us how to frame that dialogue so that it is safe, it's respectful, and it's productive. The MCPS Equity Initiatives Unit is dedicated to helping all school system employees communicate more effectively with students and their families. In activities such as this study circle, athletic directors discussed how they can better collaborate with our culturally diverse school communities. I think it helps adults think about their implicit bias in certain areas. We all have biases, and so if we want people to be culturally proficient and truly respectful of one another, we need to reach all areas of our work, including athletics. I think that sometimes these conversations people are afraid of, and I think they need to happen. I think they absolutely need to happen. Sports culture has to be built. So reaching out, getting more parents in, involved and engaged with the school, or recognizing some things that you have power within yourself to change to, to make things better is a good thing. The athletic directors will implement these strategies at their schools and share what they've discussed about equitable practices with coaches who work very closely with students and parents. As a school district, we have to use every method and mode we can, and I applaud the athletic department for doing this because they do have a connection to students and families that often aren't there in other parts of the school. So just this is another way to make those connections. We have to break down any barriers or stereotypes that exist and open our program to students from all cultures, from all socioeconomic areas. This is just the beginning. It was definitely a time to celebrate. This was the completion of the largest solar project in a county facility. Lorna Virgili was there for the major switch on and tells us where it's all taking place. Lorna? Anquanette, this is a field of 10 acres with hundreds of these panels that are intended to save about half a million dollars every year in energy costs to that facility. Five, five, four, three, two, one, up. Yay! With the throw of a switch, this marks the 15th facility in Montgomery County to transition into solar energy, moving closer to independence from the power grid. We have the land, we have the facility next door. We also have on the correction system itself panels as well. And so what you'll find in other county facilities more the traditional array of panels on top of the buildings. And all of our facilities that we can retrofit within the foreseeable future, we're going to look at them to evaluate to make certain that we can exhaust every means possible to provide the solar panels on top of it. Rows as long as 300 feet of solar panels made by Tesla are expected to produce 3.5 kilowatt hours of electricity each year, 60 percent of the energy used at the county's correctional facility. We're a 24-7 maximum security correctional facility and, and you know every day through the best of circumstances and the worst of circumstances this building, ha building has to always operate. The lights have to always work, the water has to be hot and we have to sustain, we have cooked meals, you know, people that depend on us uh, for their, their constitutional rights of, of confinement here. So having this kind of off the grid ability, not even being dependent on a generator because generators can fail, this doesn't fail, it provides us sustainability. What looks like infinite rows of panels is designed to blend with a national environment. We actually worked very, very hard to make this a very low impact project. We blended in well with the tree line to preserve as much of the habitat. And actually, this is great. You know, as the, as the um, vegetation grows, it creates great habitat for pollinators and all sorts of animals and fauna. By the end of 2018, solar projects on county property are expected to generate enough electricity to power the equivalent of 2,000 single-family homes and to save approximately $15 million during the next 20 years. Proud to be in Montgomery County where we have said to ourselves, we are committed to a sustainable future and this is part of that sustainable future. We said to our county, we should have every county facility be able to generate its own power. And the county came back and said, Roger, I'll identify every site where we can do it. And this was one of them. And here we are today celebrating this nice accomplishment. In Boyd's, for County Report this week, I'm Lorna Virgili. When we come back, we meet a women's roller derby team that's homegrown. And we take another look at the new dog park in Tacoma Park that's bow wowing everyone. Stay with us, County Report This Week. We'll be right back. 
Here's your chance to save money and help the environment. Bring your reusable bag when you shop and you'll save five cents for every store bag you don't need. Retailers in Montgomery County charge five cents for the plastic or paper bags they provide. Why? Because plastic bags are the biggest single source of stream and waterway litter, causing pollution and flooding. And every year, Montgomery County spends $3 million on cleanup. So do yourself and the environment a favor. Bring your reusable bag when you shop. You'll fight litter and keep the change. Welcome back to this end of the year special edition of County Report. This week, I'm on Quinette Crosby. There are more than 400 flat track roller derby teams that are registered around the world. One of them is right here in our own backyard. My MC Media's Mitty Hicks introduces us to the Free State Roller Derby. The women you're watching in the black and blue might be some of the toughest here in Montgomery County. As you can see, when they fall, they get right back up which players say is the goal of Free State Roller Derby. It's very physical, but it's also a great way for women to come together and it's a positive environment where we help and support each other and don't tear each other down. There are more than 400 registered women's flat track derby associations worldwide and Free State Roller Derby is the only one in Montgomery County. They're a nonprofit that strives to develop self-confidence while increasing physical fitness, no matter how well you skate. The last time I put on roller skates was maybe when I was eight, um, and I started coming to free state practices the day after I turned 21, so it had been a little while. Randazzo, who goes by the name Dread Alert, is now celebrating her five-year derbyversary. This team specifically, I think, has a really unique vibe to it. Um, we're really welcoming, we're really nurturing. Um, it's just really fun, um, but it's really um, challenging at the same time. And the team is looking for more people to join. While being a woman is required to play in the games, men are encouraged to volunteer, referee, and serve as non-skating officials to track points and help with the scoreboard. For more information, log on to mymcmedia.org. In Rockville, I'm Mitty Hicks for County Report This Week. After five years of wrangling, Tacoma Park now has a dog park. About 100 dogs and 200 people came out for the opening. The park is a great way for the dogs to exercise and socialize, and for their owners too. Five years of effort, over 1,500 signatures from supporters of the dog park, many, many, many council meetings, a lot of work's gone into this. Right, well this was fantastic because it was a typical democratic process in Tacoma Park. It started out with some neighborhood uh, people wanting something. They came to the city council member. Uh, we ignored them as long as we could and then people kept coming back and coming back and finally we uh, were able to make all the arrangements with Montgomery County and, and get the park completed. And you can hear everybody's happy to be here today. The most difficult part was like the whole, the property belonged to the city, but the parking lot and access belonged to park and planning. So getting everybody together to get the permits and approval from park and planning to let us have an access to the park was the most difficult part. Dogs that go to the dog park and socialize with other animals are much more behaved and uh, they have an outlet. Uh, it's very important that they can play and run and be active and uh, they tend to be much less destructive at home as well. So there, there are many benefits. I've been waiting for this park to open because I just got a dog a few months ago and she needs a lot more exercise than I've been able to give her and I live walking distance from here. So this is going to change my dog's life and my life. Uh, I think it's very convenient. It's nice to have a place so close where we can let our dog loose because I've been stopped so many times by police officers for having my dog off the leash, so it's nice to know that he can play around here and I won't get in trouble for it. We're very, very excited to have this open. and people. We've had about 100 dogs here today uh, and uh, many, many more people, and they're thrilled. Everyone is really, really happy. That's what, that's 
And with that, we close this special edition of County Report this week. We will return in 2018 with all of the stories that impact you as a county resident. From all of us here, we wish you a safe holiday season. And remember, the county offers sober ride services over the holidays. Call this number if you have had one too many drinks during the celebrations. I'm on Quinette Crosby. Happy holidays.